Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first of WABA's regional webinar series on father support uh, for breastfeeding. We are focusing today on the Southeast Asia region, uh, but we are happy to see that uh, there are many participants from other parts of the world. And I'm sure that this is an issue, that topic that engages everybody wherever you are. We have a 90 minute uh, webinar and we will have presentations and speakers from different parts of the world. WABA since 2002 has promoted the idea of engaging and involving fathers in supporting breastfeeding. We had our GIFS, the Global Initiative for Father Support. Some of you will remember that. And over the years, we have included fathers as important support persons for uh, supporting women to breastfeed. I would also like to say that in relation to World Breastfeeding Week 2020, with this, the theme of which was support breastfeeding for a healthier planet, we are now focusing on the support and this aspect of supportive fathers. Although we do talk about fathers in this webinar, we also acknowledge and understand that there are many uh, situations where there may be partners, uh, we may not have fathers present and so on and so forth. But this webinar focuses on fathers. We will be showcasing some of the evidence and we will also be looking at country uh, presentations and studies that have been ongoing in Indonesia, Malaysia, and also in Myanmar. The COVID pandemic has posed many challenges for all of us and some more than others, but we also see that there are many opportunities to build back better. And this is a slogan that we definitely would like to work with you all. We have a warm chain campaign. I think many of you have heard about the warm chain of support for breastfeeding. And we will be also presenting some of the ways you can conduct advocacy to enhance the involvement and engagement of fathers. I have a few uh, housekeeping rules for this um, webinar. We are many people here today. And so whilst we are chatting, in the chat boxes, we should try to um, maintain civility and respect for the speakers and also the other attendees, and also to refrain them from any personal attacks. If you want to interact with the panelists, you have to, um, you can do that in the chat box or you can post your questions in the Q&A. And if you have questions directed to a panelist, you please indicate that in the Q&A. But do use the chat box to chat with each other or with the panelists or with us. And you can um, say where you're from, who you are and your affiliation as well. We will also be having a few anonymous polls and the first one you have seen already. And here we have, we can see that most people agree that father support is important and that there are about a quarter of the attendees report that there are breastfeeding support groups uh, for fathers in their area where they live. So with that, I would like to start with the first session one. And session one is going to be looking at the evidence. And the evidence that we know, uh, we have three speakers. We have Dr. Lynn Rempel, and Dr. John Rempel and Duncan Fisher. Lynn Rempel is a ner retired nursing professor at Brock University and she has been studying father involvement in breastfeeding in Canada, Botswana and Vietnam. And she has extensive experience of workshops, training and also developing guidelines. John Rempel is a psychology professor at St. Jerome's University at the University of Waterloo in Canada. He has been studying the relationships as, such as partner support, love, trust, hate, and empathy. And he has applied many of these concepts to programs in around the world. 
Duncan Fisher is for the last 20 years has been involved in helping health and family services to engage better with the whole wider family and fathers in particular. He is a co-founder of the Fatherhood Institute and has served on numerous boards and worked with guideline development, including currently with WHO. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first session and Lynn, John and Duncan, go ahead. So Duncan? Hello. Start. Hi. Hi, so thank you very much, Amal, for that introduction. Um, and we're gonna kick off straight away um, by looking first at the evidence base. There's quite a lot of evidence from around the world. Um, and we have focused a bit here on the Southeast Asia region. Um, this is just an introductory picture. It's a, a beautiful picture of um, that was caught by a photographer in a hospital in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Um, it wasn't set up um, and uh, it, it, it was taken by, um, it was commissioned by UNICEF as part of a campaign to look at the role of fathers in the first hours and days after a baby is born. But this is one where the father is actually supporting breastfeeding actively. So the evidence is quite clear um, that family, not, not just fathers, but fathers and family members are a very big influence on breastfeeding. Um, women often rate their partner as the biggest uh, influence on their breastfeeding, even more so than professionals. That was found in the study. Um, the, the influence extends both to the intention of the mother to start breastfeeding before she does uh, antenatally and the extent of breastfeeding, the, the, the length of exclusive breastfeeding uh, um, and the, the time of breastfeeding uh, after the birth. But there is a great deal of diversity across cultures uh, as to um, how a family supports breastfeeding. Um, so, and, and that there's a yeah, great deal of diversity in that. Um, as Amal said, um, we, we acknowledge that, that fathers are not always present and sometimes uh, they can be a negative influence. And it's really the role of health professionals and breastfeeding uh, supporters to understand the family dynamic and understand what's going on and be aware of that possibility. And of course, if that, it, that possibility is there, then um, the, the, the mother, the breastfeeding mother will need additional support uh, if it's not available at home. But in this presentation, we are focusing on fathers uh, because they have a, a biological investment in the child. They have a bond with the child. They are overwhelming, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they are the other parent that is present. And there is the gender issue. It's often, they're often considered uh, not uh, so important for breastfeeding it's simply because they're men. Uh, this is a, a statement made by Live and Thrive, which is a major global nutrition uh, organization. Um, and they did a survey um, and looked at practice and they came up with this statement that uh, the failure to include fathers in infant and young child feeding may limit the efficacy and effectiveness of programs and initiatives. So now I'm gonna hand over to John. So uh, I think the question is what do fathers do with respect to breastfeeding? Well, it varies. Uh, one study found that uh, although most fathers might have an opinion, a lot of them prefer to keep their opinion to themselves. But then there were some fathers who had no opinion at all. Some fathers were more positive than the mother. Other fathers were more negative. Some fathers helped in practical and emotional ways. Uh, some did not. And then there were some who became breastfeeding advocates. And this last point is important. Uh, in every community, there are going to be those fathers who actively support breastfeeding, uh, even if it goes against the strong cultural norms. Uh, health professionals can identify these fathers they are the ones that you're going to find with mothers at the health clinics. Uh, they are people who can be seen as allies and 
need to be supported in what they're doing. But even uh, when the majority of fathers say they don't want to pressure the mother, it's important to recognize that they still have an influence. Fathers can influence mothers when they express their comfort or discomfort with breastfeeding or with breastfeeding in public. And even if they don't actually say anything, mothers can tell. Fathers can influence the mother by how involved or distant they are during the birth. And they can have an influence by how much they become involved in caring for the mother and the baby after birth. And fathers can have an impact when they gain or lose the mother's confidence. Research indicates that engaging fathers works. In the past couple of years, two systematic reviews have examined controlled intervention studies that reported effects of educating fathers to support breastfeeding on breastfeeding outcomes. About a, a dozen studies were reviewed and all improved at least one outcome in comparison to when fathers were not included in breastfeeding education. The studies found that paternal support was greater when fathers were educated and mothers were more satisfied with the father involvement. Breastfeeding outcomes included that more mothers initiated breastfeeding and there was greater breastfeeding exclusivity and longer duration over the first six months. A couple of studies in the reviews were conducted in Asia. In China, a breastfeeding education group, including both mothers and fathers, was compared to a mother-only group. When fathers were included in the education group, 51% of mothers exclusively breastfed to six months compared to 26% when fathers were not included. Use of formula by intervention mothers at one month was only 6% compared to 24%, and use of infant formula at six months was 20% compared to 44%. Mother's attitudes and their knowledge about breastfeeding were stronger and mothers were happier. Fathers did more caring for their infants, more housework, and were more likely to be helpful and supportive when breastfeeding was challenging. In Vietnam, a study was done in which fathers were provided with breastfeeding information, support, and home visits by health workers. There were mass media communications regarding the benefits of breastfeeding, and there were community events. Results indicated that the initiation of breastfeeding within one hour of birth was 81% when fathers had been educated compared to 40% in the control group. Also exclusive breastfeeding at four months was 21% compared to 11% in the control group. So our understanding of the published evidence and the research we have conducted suggests that there are three important principles to address when engaging fathers. These are information, mother-father teamwork, and father-baby bond. The first principle is providing information. Fathers need to know something about breastfeeding and how they might be able to help the mother in order to provide support. An Australian randomized controlled trial with 699 couples tested this by providing a two hour antenatal session and sending weekly information to fathers postnatally. Informing fathers resulted in a breastfeeding rate at six weeks of 82% compared to 75% in the control group. Not engaging fathers effectively can actually possibly have negative effects. For example, one study in Japan, in Japan found that without any, any intervention, educating fathers about breastfeeding support, when fathers were more actively involved in infant care, infants were actually less likely to be breastfed during the first six months. However, as indicated by the systematic reviews, when fathers are informed, there's more breastfeeding initiation, more exclusivity, and longer breastfeeding duration. But fathers are rarely informed. Many studies find that fathers are left out. 
A study in Pakistan showed that even fathers who were supportive of breastfeeding were excluded by healthcare providers and were not given help to support their wives during breastfeeding. So how can fathers provide effective breastfeeding support? Uh, we have developed the concept of uh, mother-father teens. Having knowledge about breastfeeding is very important, but in our work, we have found that fathers uh, can support breastfeeding in a lot of different ways. Fathers can be supportive when they are helpful and provide practical support. Uh, they can be uh, supportive when they show the mother how much they appreciate uh, when she cares for and breastfeeds her infant. And um, they can be supportive when they're physically present uh, while the mother is breastfeeding. And these things can all be very helpful when they are needed. But when they're not needed, they can actually sometimes get in the way. When it comes to breastfeeding support, we have found that the most important thing is for fathers to be sensitive and responsive to what the mother needs. And that includes knowing when help is not needed. In our research, we found that only this kind of responsive support consistently led to longer breastfeeding. So what does this responsiveness look like? Well, consider the analogy of a highly effective two-person team. Uh, I often think of some uh, sport like beach volleyball, where there's only two players versus six, or doubles badminton, or tennis, or perhaps you can think of a, a card game where you have a partner, or some other context in which you've got teams that, need to, that only consist of two people and need to work together. Okay, two-person teams are unique. Uh, in an effective two-person team, each partner needs a broad, flexible skill set. There's only two of you, so you have to be versatile. Each partner needs to coordinate with the other. Uh, they need to be observant, pay attention to what the other person is doing. They need to communicate, and they need to adjust to the situation and be adaptable. They also need to know when to step back and trust that their partner has things under control and can handle the situation. Responsive support is key because it is sensitive to what the mother needs, it respects her autonomy, and it shows trust in her abilities. For practitioners, the goal should be to teach fathers how they can provide responsive support by working together uh, they teach fathers to provide some responsive support by working together with the mother as part of a parenting or breastfeeding team. Uh, but practitioners can also model responsive support when they are giving practical advice. If advice is too specific, it can crowd out the flexibility needed by the couple to respond to the mother's particular needs in that particular situation. Thank you very much. Um, so the final uh, aspect of the um, approach that um, John and Lynn Rempel have been presenting is the father-baby bond. And perhaps surprisingly, um, the, the stronger the father-baby bond is, uh, the more breastfeeding there is. There's a correlation there. Um, interestingly, in one study in Taiwan, which was not about breastfeeding, it was simply looking at skin-to-skin -skin care uh, and th they compared one group receiving of fathers who received hands-on support with skin-to-skin -skin care. Um, and they found that those who had received that support, uh, there was more breastfeeding in those families. There was no mention of breastfeeding at all in the intervention, um, suggesting that there's a direct link uh, between how close the, the father feels to the baby and is with the baby and breastfeeding. We need to understand this a little bit, I won't go into great detail here, but when caring for babies, fathers undergo hormonal and neurobiological changes that tune them in to care, in, into the care of the infant. And the more they care, the more those changes happen, both hormonal and, and brain changes. Even prolactin, the breastfeeding hormone, increases in fathers, particularly if the baby is vulnerable. Um, 
And this is part of the human uh, condition of, of caring for babies together as a team. This is biological, we've evolved with it. And a key point to make in, in working with families is that breastfeeding is only one way to bond with the, the, the baby. There are many other ways uh, where the father can uh, develop the bond. It's all about physical interaction, uh, cuddling, carrying, playing, bathing. And research has found that only a minority of fathers actually feel jealous of breastfeeding and want it to stop because they can't bond with the baby or they feel they can't. So to summarize, uh, the goal for engaging fathers in breastfeeding support is to give fathers accurate information, uh, support team breastfeeding, and support father-baby bonding. Uh, we would like to use <clears throat> a research project that, we were, that Lynn and I were involved in in Vietnam as an example of how to meet these goals in an integrated approach. Uh, this intervention extended the research by Bick and his colleagues, and it included counseling, uh, both before uh, the baby was born in a workshop and uh, a group workshop with fathers and then also in a home visit and then at three points after the birth of the baby, one, six and 15 weeks uh, for in-home visits. And then also while in the hospital, fathers received a session with a midwife where they interacted with their newborn baby. Uh, we also had mass media communication, posters, uh, loudspeaker broadcasts in town. Uh, and then after several months, there were social activities added like father's clubs, a Facebook club. And there was uh, this pro project ended with a public contest on father's knowledge. In the intervention, health workers informed fathers about breastfeeding. Um, fathers were also informed about infant development and given ideas for how they could interact with their infants. The health workers taught the fathers about team parenting. They used the teamwork analogy to help fathers think about how they could responsibly support the mother while respecting her, uh, her autonomy. And they modeled teamwork as they uh, talked with fathers and helped them to identify their own unique ways of working with the mother as a team. Fathers were also encouraged to bond with their babies during the in-hospital session with the midwife and during home visit discussions in which they were encouraged to identify their own unique ways of interacting with the baby. We found that compared to a control group of fathers who did not get the father engagement counseling, uh, fathers were more responsive and helpful in supporting breastfeeding. And as a result, exclusive breastfeeding rates were higher right to six months. In addition, the couple's relationship quality improved, fathers interacted more with their infants and were more emotionally bonded with their infants. As a result of all these forms of father involvement, infant cognitive, motor and social emotional development all were higher at nine months. Thus, we've even found that engaging fathers as responsive members of the breastfeeding and parenting team works and is good for the whole family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive, uh, for the comprehensive uh, run through the evidence. And I think it's quite impressive to see and encouraging to see that there is so much research from different parts of the world, all pointing in the same direction. And the breastfeeding as a teamwork, I think that's a concept that we can uh, use and, and to, to understand better on how the different roles of the team members um, can be enhanced. Um, I would like to encourage um, all the attendees to, to ask uh, questions in the Q&A. The panelists will respond. So please post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you want to say hello and uh, chat with each other, you can do that in the chat box. So now I would like to, we will be moving on uh, to the next um, session, session two. Um, here we are going to be looking at country perspectives and we have uh, three countries. We have Indonesia, we have um, Myanmar and we have Malaysia. <coughs> 
Uh, the perspectives that will be shared will be looking at healthcare perspectives, workplace, community, and also individual personal experiences. And the first person to speak, the first speaker in this session will be Rahmat Hidayat, who is the co-founder of Aya Asi Indonesia, which is the Indonesian breastfeeding uh, supporting fathers. It's a social movement for fathers in providing support to increase breastfeeding rates in the country. Rahmat is a lactation counselor and works closely with um, many organizations working on HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and sexual and reproductive health and rights issues. IRC since 2019 is rolling out lactation classes for fathers in Indonesia and is currently preparing for online classes as we all have to go digital due to the COVID pandemic. So Rahmat, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Amal. Uh, thank you, Waba, for inviting Ayasi to this uh, important webinar. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rahmat Hidayat. You can call me Rahmat. Uh, I'm one of the co founder of Ayasi. It's the Indonesian for, it's the uh, Indonesian breastfeed supporting fathers, like Amal already said. I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to share the experience and how to engage father in breastfeeding support here in uh, Indonesia. So IRC uh, was initiated by a group of fathers uh, in 2011 with a dream that breastfeeding will become a popular in Indonesia through the involvement of fathers. Uh, we started the campaign by publishing a book entitled Breastfeeding Father's Diary, uh, and it became uh, a national bestseller. Um, and then IRC were covered by national newspaper, magazines, and national TV, and has initiated similar movement in more than 10 cities in, in Indonesia. Um, aware of limited time and resources, we choose to use social media uh, with tens of thousand followers on Instagram and hundreds of thousands on, on Twitter. Um, like Amal said, we already launched the training model for the breastfeeding fathers, uh, but I'll tell you about this on the another slide. Um, talking about my personal experience, I feel that I don't have much memory with my late father. Um, so when I got married and my wife got pregnant, I intended to be fully involved in my child development. And of course, it was starting from a pregnancy, breastfeeding and, and beyond. Uh, and then I joined the um, lactation counselor training and now here I am. Talking about the Indonesia, based on the Indonesia Demographic and Health Survey 2017, uh, only one in two baby under six months are exclusively, exclusively breastfed. Um, and by 23 months of age, slightly more than half of children continue to be breastfed, uh, meaning that uh, nearly half of all Indonesian children are not receiving the nourishment they need during their first two years of life. <clears throat> on, on the other issue, uh, more than 40% of babies uh, are introduced to complementary foods too early before reaching six months and often with foods that do not meet their uh, nutritional needs. So IRC is believed that breastfeeding is the gateway to the involvement of fathers in, in parenting. Uh, by supporting uh, breastfeeding, uh, fathers can also learn about the signs of baby hungers, about how to calm a baby when it cries, about how to hold the baby, including uh, how to feed. Uh, so it's actually, uh, for us, this is beyond breastfeeding. It's about breaking the gender roles and the patriarchy, hopefully. Um, Talking about the process of founding Ayaasi, I think uh, first we need the, the champions. Uh, we are aware that we are not the first to provide uh, breastfeeding support to wives. Uh, we believe that many dads uh, have already done that, uh, but perhaps we are the first to appear in public uh, as a movement. So I think it's important to find this kind of dads. Um, and then uh, since we know the issue is very closely related to women, uh, it is important not to leave us behind, uh, so providing a safe and comfortable space for men to discuss breastfeeding, I think is, is very uh, important. Um,
our slide presentation. Um, and that gives us a, a huge impact. Um, there are a lot of local government after her presentation, contact us and also uh, share our experience, uh, to share our experience in their district. Um, like I told you before, since uh, most of IASI volunteers is working uh, 9 to 5, uh, Monday to Friday, uh, and even sometimes also uh, on a weekend, uh, the time and resources is become our big challenges. And that is one of the reasons that IASI is not yet uh, a formal organization with structure uh, and a strategic plan. Uh, we, uh, the co-founders actually were afraid that if it gets too official, the fun element of doing this campaign will be lost. Uh, but on the other hand, we also cannot turn a blind eye that funding support from donors uh, often has to be based on the official um, institution. So uh, up until today, the social media has become our major channel to reach other fathers. And we also aware that the social media only reach urban uh, fathers. And I think the story will bring us to class IASI. We call the class IASI is a lactation class for fathers. This is a short course for fathers to learn about breastfeeding and how to support their wives. Uh, we just launched the model officially on the last uh, World Breastfeeding Week. And since, since mid 2019, uh, we already developed and already piloting the class to more than 10 cities in Indonesia, uh, involving 200 uh, fathers. Uh, so far, we were very happy with the feedback and the results. Uh, at least there was an increase in knowledge uh, that what we saw uh, from the pretest uh, results. So actually in uh, 2020, we are planning to work with the primary health cares uh, in many districts uh, to reach out the rural fathers. But then as we know, the COVID-19 was hitting us. Uh, and like any organization, we tried to adapt with the situation. And uh, we are planning to have uh, three batches of training until December 2020. Uh, so we are piloting this online class. Uh, and right now we are in the middle of uh, planning to have, uh, we are playing, we are running in the second batch already involving 100 uh, fathers. Talking about uh, WABA, I think WABA can help us by initiating a network uh, at, at, at the uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, that is including provide best practice and, and, and evidence in the region. I know Duncan also have already done that with the familyincluded.com. And I think we can uh, support that. Uh, and I think also important to provide uh, IC material containing uh, practical tips uh, for fathers. So the key messages, uh, Please don't leave us behind. Uh, for government, please provide us sufficient paternity leave. For other partners, please provide us a safe place to discuss between fathers. And for our families, please don't push us to hurt and trust us to take care of the wives and children. And I think one of the lessons that uh, we learned from IAC class uh, is that if fathers are given a safe and comfortable space to talk, they will speak up. Uh, we need a lot of support to expand the approach in Indonesia. Uh, so if you want to help us, please don't hesitate to contact me or IASI. Uh, we know that the peer-to-peer -peer approach is working. So I think it's time to support each other. I think that would be all. Uh, we have this slogan in IASI, Bikinnya berdua, ngurus anaknya juga berdua. Or in English, there will be a make a baby together and raise it together. Uh, I'm Ramah Hidayat from IASI. Back to you, Amal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahmat. And I think there were many things that uh, stuck in my mind. And one was, don't leave us behind. And we do have, as part of the sustainable development goals, leaving no one behind, and that includes fathers. And I also like the way that you are scaling up your program nationwide in, in Indonesia. And we wish you all the best of luck. And I think you are really showing that this requires a social movement. And this is what we would like to see and see how we can support you. And you've given us numbers of ways that we can do that. So thank you very much, Rahmat. So the next speaker uh, is from Myanmar. It's Son Yin Yi, who is a nutritionist and a breastfeeding advocate and a proud father of two exclusively breastfed children. He has over 10 years of experience in public health nutrition 
and policy advocacy. And he's currently working with the United Nations World Food Program as the REACH National Facilitator and coordinating the Scaling Up Nutrition United Nations Network in Myanmar. So I would like to introduce, uh, to give you the floor, Sunyi, go ahead. Thank you, Omal. Thank you all for giving this opportunity to share my experience as a father and as, as, as a nutrition, nutritionist in my country. Um, as Al Almer mentioned, uh, I'm, in, I'm Sunyi Nyi and I'm REACH National Facility to coordinating the San Yuan Network. So I'll, uh, in my presentation, I will be briefly covering these topics, um, um, breastfeeding, how breastfeeding and fathers are engaging in my country, and um, my view as my view on breastfeeding, and also um, uh, how the fathers, as a father's perspective on breastfeeding, and the breastfeeding in my workplace, and and my my suggestions for engaging more engaging uh, more fathers for breastfeeding in the future. So in my country, uh, traditionally, uh, we believe like people believe that fathers should not engage in childbirth or uh, breastfeeding is only women's things. Uh, women can only do these things, and these these are related to uh, only to women. And uh, there are also strong gender lines on what men are supposed to do and what women are supposed to do. And it is very very difficult to cross these gender lines because those are all strongly set in the community at different levels. And um, at the system level, uh, men are not allowed to attend the bath or take care of their wives during uh, the bath or uh, after after delivery of the newborn babies at the hospitals and maternity facilities, especially at the public facilities. I myself experienced being kept out of uh, the maternity unit where my, my wife and baby are attending, attending. And also I also observed many fathers who were not allowed to come to the, to the hospital to see, I mean, to see the, the wives and baby. Of course, you know, there is a kind of certain period of time that Men and get allowed to see the the the, the new uh, the mother and the, uh, the newborn babies, but those periods are normally short and it's in rush. And we cannot um, like as fathers, we cannot really help uh, the wives and the, the babies who are are desperately needing the the husband uh, support uh, emotionally or physically. And uh, culturally, uh, women of the household takes. Uh, that roll over and displays father's role. And also, as I mentioned, the system also uh, doesn't allow to, to, uh, for fathers to fully engage in, in child care. And it, it is limiting the role of fathers uh, to engage and to spend their time with their, their new babies. So uh, to me, um, I understand that uh, breastfeeding is a right to the child. This is the first right the baby would ever have since uh, he, he or she is given birth, he, he or she should be uh, receiving breast milk immediately after birth. This is the, um, the first right uh, as a, at the beginning of the human life. And it's also a right to the mother because the mother should be able to breastfeed as and when she wants to breastfeed her, her, her baby. And um, as we always know that uh, breastfeeding is natural, it's almost risk-free. Uh, comparing to other other means like uh, other uh, other breast milk substitutes, and also uh, there are strong global evidence stating that breastfeeding can save lives. At the same time, breastfeeding itself is vulnerable. Therefore, um, breastfeeding needs promotion, production, and supporting. I have to thank uh, Warbur for this amazing infographic on the right illustrating the importance of breastfeeding for achieving all these sustainable development goals. Uh, as a father, from my own perspective, uh, breastfeeding is not easy. It's very challenging task, especially for women. And um, breastfeeding is the best, we all know that. But as I mentioned in the previous slide, it is vulnerable, especially in the countries or in the places where the WHO BMS code is not fully adopted or enforced or implemented. Uh, breastfeeding is, is weakened by the unethical advertisement of, of the breast milk substitute companies and also weakened health systems and weak, uh, weak policies, regulations. 
And um, I, as a father, I see uh, recipe is not only the, the women's business. I mean, uh, of course, you know, we don't have, man doesn't have bread, um, but we can help our wives in different ways. And um, breastfeeding is ideal twice for families. If you want to have a happy family, you can start with breastfeeding the baby. Um, and um, the, the, on the other hand, the mother should be able to breastfeed their babies whenever and wherever they need and as long as they want or they wish. For that, uh, we fathers can stand by with our wives and we can provide the support that they need from our, from our best uh, capacity. But at the same time, fathers should not be over-concerned over father, and, uh, but at NCT, we can be best, best breastfeeding advocates. So in terms of our place, I'm lucky enough. Uh, my place is uh, quite uh, breastfeeding fr friendly, and we can help our women colleagues to be able to breastfeed uh, even they return to, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the workplace. Uh, but not all, all the workplaces are like mine. There are many limitations. There are unequal, uh, unequal opportunities and also unequal uh, rights, uh, and also especially for those women uh, in, in former studies. So uh, to be able to uh, facilitate more engagement of fathers in future, I would like to suggest making, making sure that, that health systems are more baby friendly, more breastfeeding friendly, and more family friendly. And uh, we need to remove all the cultural and systematic barriers that I presented earlier so that fathers can engage in maternity, maternity care and child care. And we need to, we fathers need to learn about breastfeeding so that we can uh, effectively help our wives, including how to child care, how to take care of the children, how to help the wives with house chores. And I think um, longer paternity, paternity leave will allow us to spend more time so we can help both mothers and babies. And I would like to repeat here, because it is very important, we need to effectively adopt and implement WHO BMS codes and allow with it uh, relevant resolutions. So here are three key messages that I would like to share um, to create uh, the systems and environment that can accommodate uh, fathers to involve in the maternity and child care, including uh, supporting breastfeeding. Second message I would like to share is uh, we need to encourage fathers to take more steps in supporting their wives with child care and other house chores. And thirdly, we need to create for, uh, for fathers to be able to learn more about breastfeeding like, like our colleagues from Indonesia uh, are doing. And also um, we need to learn more about uh, child nutrition and other matters related to child development and positive dis discipline. So in summary, uh, I would like to thank you by highlighting the fact that uh, men, are, men and women are equally responsible for raising the children and developing their family. That's, I would like to here highlight that we both men and women should be equally empowered for uh, child care. Thank you very much. Over to you, Amal. Thank you so much, Sun Yi. That's uh, amazing to hear also how Myanmar and your own experiences um, play into this. And I particularly like the fact that you um, position this as a child rights um, issue and that it's everyone's business and that you highlighted also the issue of gender equality. And this is something that all over the world we are working towards, it's a struggle. Um, we're not there and it needs to be discussed more and also in the context of breastfeeding. And I think here we do know that if we get it right, we can have gender equality, we can have child rights and women's rights and everybody's rights also. Um, but governments needs to support this and we need to work together to make it happen. So thank you so much for, for presenting also from your perspective and your country. Um, so we will be moving on to the next speaker. We have, um, we have here Muturamu Gurusami from Malaysia. And um, just to introduce um, Muturamu, he is an engineer, engineering manager with um, working with uh, a multinational company based in Penang, Malaysia. 
Uh, he started off as a supportive husband to his wife when she was getting involved with a local breastfeeding support group, MMPS, and then slowly got into the academics while helping her on literature review and proofreading of her assignments during her master's studies in social science. And he's now supporting her in pursuing her PhD related to breastfeeding. And that's when he began to understand the roles and responsibilities of organizations like WABA, plus the impact it creates to the world. And so, Muturamo, please, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Mutu Gurusami. I can give a quick perspective of, uh, from a user point of view. Uh, unlike all the other presentations that you have seen, someone who is doing a full-time uh, or in heavily involved in, in, in the broadcasting of breastfeeding, I'm just a regular father who's going to give it from a father's point of view. I'm going to give a quick introduction about myself. I'm in the late 40s. I've got three boys, a 15, 12, and a 4. I'm happily married for the past 20 years to a lovely wife. And, and she is the person who has been very passionate about this. In fact, she did her master's in the breastfeeding hospital initiative, step three. And now she's pursuing her PhD studies in, in postpartum breastfeeding challenges. So I'm like a second hand reader. I, I do a lot of her presentations, uh, read out to make sure a sentence is all correct. I do a lot of photocopying work. So that's where I picked up all this knowledge unknowingly. And that's, that's brought me up here today to speak about this topic. Professionally, I'm attached to a semiconductor industry uh, based in Penang. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about how this impacted us specifically on travels, right? We had good experience living in a couple of countries here in Southeast Asia and also in America. So we have good experience there that I can bring for some sharing. Personally, I'm just a regular guy who's trying to involve to do the right thing for the community. I'm passionate about what happens in education, STEM-related studies. I'm an active member in a Parents' Research Association. Okay, uh, personal experience. Uh, I'm going to zoom down a little bit for those who are aware uh, of Penang Island in the northern region. You can see on your top right corner, a small little island out there, beautiful one. And I've crafted in a Google map that shows the golden triangle of our life consistently, right? So right at the bottom, you see a small word, Epo. That's, that's where I am from, my hometown. And right up north, right there, Kulim. It's a small little town, Kulim, where my wife is from. So for the first 12 years of our life, it has been a golden triangle travel every weekend. Um, you know, we, we, I'm the youngest in the family, so it has been a long time before my parents actually get to uh, feel grandchildren. So they were always on demand. So it's always Friday, rush back home, pack your bags, Zoom make a pit stop in Ipoh, come up north and come back in. So um, that, that's one part of the equation is that our lifestyle was engaged into. Second part of the equation is, as I mentioned, due to my business, there was a couple of travels that we need to engage ourselves, like crossing over the Pacific, heading to America, that literally you spend about 24 hours entirely in the transit. And these are the avenues I really wished, oh my God, what, what is a great blessing if your kids are being breastfed. You do not have to go through the nitty gritty details about finding the right water, to clean up the bottle, uh, even in rest and recreational areas in the freeways. You don't have to worry any about it. And then you get to sleep in the plane, right? Very peacefully. So this has constructed our life to, to be a little bit more mobile. We're not too worried to go to, into countries where we know clean and safe waters are difficult. Uh, and always uh, our traveling is always light and easy. So we, we never had that burden of carrying extra baggage, extra items, whatnot. Right? So that, that's a big benefit uh, for most of us. Second part of the equation, I would try to cut in into the benefits of cost saving, right? I I, I never have to worry about, oh my God, I'm going to be running this type of milk I need to buy. Uh, same or similar type of milk uh, in, in another country. And this has never been in my list. So that will help. 
quite a bit in terms of and and finally the last item i'll, I'll bring up is um, peace uh, there isn't a situation i need to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to mix formula milk or anything like that so you just get to proceed as is um, and, and fathers out there who are listening in, in this call uh, this is something absolutely worth uh, for us to be in again um, let me touch a little bit about family integration um, having a kid who's breastfed and all of us being together this is definitely going to bring a close integration among the family that, that's that's for sure something that you'll see the rest of your lives uh, as the kid grows up the integration with the family stays strong um, similarly i would say benefits of health uh, we are very very fortunate i do not have to rush in to bring my kid to go see child specialists as often I do not have the data in my hand to say that breastfed kids uh, have got much better immune system. And right now, given this pandemic situation, right, it gives a little bit of peace in mind, saying that, hey, my kid has got a little bit more strength in him that able to take in the risk right now that we are seeing. We are ready to go out. We can live live as it is, swim, you know, eat street food. We live in Penang. So we could actually live our life with a little bit more of peace in the mind. A couple of thoughts to share. Um, first thing I want to bring up here is breastfeeding is, is as we've seen other presenters, is a two-person effort. The, the fathers should not take a neutral path. I would say the fathers has to stand up and say that I am going to support this part of the equation. That, that's absolutely needed. We are going to be facing with several of uh, challenges you know, in the environment. You know, in some of the Asia region, breastfeeding in public is not totally accepted yet. So that may be a little bit of social stigma that you need to go through. Uh, in, in some areas, we may not be blessed enough to have, you know, mother's room, ease accessibility. Those challenges we have to go through. And in the cultural norms, right, breastfeeding kids, you know, usually the metabolic rate is very high. They are much more healthy baby, but from the eyes of the public view, they may not be as chubby looking. So those are some of the cultural norms that we need to fight through as parents as we go through. And always, you know, stick with the agenda, right? If we are going to be giving the best education, uh, best healthcare, why not give the best solution for your baby, right? Have that. And help is everywhere. That's something that everybody needs to understand. You're not alone in this journey. You have got help. What can organizations like WABA do or other organizations can support? Now, number one, I, I think it's absolutely important to get the fathers involved as early as possible in any of the decision making. Specific details about labor room, or how you're going to be doing rooming in. You need to know those details so that you can have your rights secured. Um, kind of medications that's going to be used during the process. So these are important informations that the father needs to be fed with. Second is, say, you know, Baba could come like a readiness kit or a checklist for new fathers for them to be a little bit more prepared. So in summary, uh, I, as I would like to point out, it's a joint effort between both a father and mother has to be involved. The knowledge transition to father is extremely important. You know, there's going to be situations that you got to be there at the labor room and you have to demand and saying that I want to have my kid to experience skin screws in contact right after delivery. Those are technical scenarios, details that you should be in the right frame of mind to be able to ask for those. And finally, in my personal experience, right, things are not going to be going as per plan. It is not straightforward. Uh, I'm an engineer by profession, but... Uh, you have to take this as more of an art than science to get through success. That would be all. Thank you. Back to you, Amal. Thanks so much, Muturamo. And I think your, your personal experience is really moving. It is telling us, you know, so many things that about the practicalities, how practical a, a having a breastfed child is, that you have no worries or little worries perhaps because we all do have worries from time to time, but also the cost savings issue and also the, the issues of stigma that we have to overcome and that the importance of having to stick to your agenda. I think that's really important. And we have heard from Indonesia, from Myanmar, and also from Malaysia, different perspectives on how to engage 
fathers and how to make this a social movement. So here we have a poll. So please do answer this poll. Um, the question is, in your opinion, which one of the following is the greatest barrier for fathers and co-parents to support breastfeeding? So whilst you're answering the poll, I'm going to introduce the third session. And this is the last session in our um, webinar. Uh, this session is looking at opportunities for advocacy and also service delivery to enhance fathers' involvement. And the first speaker who is going to talk to us is Jezza Mahal, who is the head of the training at the UK Fatherhood Institute, where she supports health and family services, practitioners and policy makers to better engage with fathers. Her three year Churchill Fellowship took her to the Caribbean and to the USA to identify strategies to engage fathers in the promotion of breastfeeding. So I'd like to hand over to you, Jezema. Go ahead. Thank you, Amal. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, the Fatherhood Institute is working towards creating a society in which mothers and fathers share the task of earning and childcare, uh, which brings wide ranging benefits to couples, reduces the gender pay gap and creates possible possibilities for our children to make future choices free of gender stereotyping. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the most recent research, in particular, uh, research from families throughout the pandemic. Um, this new research is coming in all the time, and this cohort of new parents may well become one of the most studied groups of parents in recent history. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of this research is from the UK or the USA, but hopefully you will find some similarities uh, and commonalities. And also going later on in the, uh, in the presentations means a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, has already been said. <laughs> so the COVID pandemic and subsequent lockdown and social distancing led to changes to breastfeeding support available to women in the United Kingdom and globally. Face-to-face -face professional support was reduced and peer support was cancelled. Meanwhile, new families were confined to their homes, separated from families and support networks. Over the past few decades, dad's presence at the birth has become normalised and sometimes expected, as has attended key scans, appointments and be involved and present on the postnatal ward. However, during the pandemic, despite clear guidance, almost 80% of fathers were excluded from scans from significant parts of the labour and on postnatal wards. We are still mid-pandemic and the full impact of these restrictions on mothers, fathers and babies is difficult to quantify. It is clear that women's experiences of COVID-19 and breastfeeding differ significantly according to their experience of lockdown. Around 30% of new mothers felt that lockdown had a negative experience, uh, ne negative impact. Uh, and 82% of those women stopped breastfeeding before they were ready, directly blaming the impact of the pandemic. 70% of those women attributed it to a lack of face-to-face -face support and 20% were worried about the safety of breastfeeding. Women had, who had a more difficult time breastfeeding lived in more challenging circumstances. Black and Asian and minority ethnic women in the UK and those with a lower education were more likely to be represented in this group. Many of those did not have access to support and felt that changes to support directly impacted their decision to stop breastfeeding and fathers reported not feeling equipped to support their partner. I'm scared for my child. I'm scared for my partner. I'm scared that if I lose my job, I'll not be able to pay rent. I'm scared of going homeless and having nowhere to go. And here is the challenge, engaging the fathers who have competing priorities. 
85% of health professionals report that mothers were distressed by the restrictions placed upon the father. But were there any positives? 42% of mothers actually reported that the pandemic had a positive impact on their infant feeding experiences. It appeared that it forced or encouraged some mothers into situations where they were able to do a lot of things that we know support breastfeeding well, such as increased time to get breastfeeding established, fewer interruptions, and more time with supportive partners. Effectively, these women's experiences emulate those seen in many cultures where postnatal recovery and care are prioritised through rest, food and care. Mothers who found the experience more positive were more privileged in their living circumstances. They had more space in their homes, they had access to outside areas, green space for exercise, faster Wi-Fi connections, meaning online support, and fewer financial difficulties. Breastfeeding, and more broadly, caring for their infant, was supported by the environment in which they live in and the support they received from their partners. Fathers have been able to spend more time with their babies and their partners. And on average, um, during lockdown, fathers have nearly doubled the time they spend on childcare and spend eight hours a day in some form of childcare compared with four hours in 2014. The pandemic gives us a unique opportunity to explore fathers and father figures' circumstances, experiences and aspirations in relation to work and caretaking, and to reflect on relationships with children and gender roles in families. This large increase in fathers' involvement in childcare might have long-lasting impacts on how couples share childcare responsibilities. Fathers are doing more within the household since records began, but it may be the case that this trend can reverse once life returns to normal and fathers return to work uh, full time. Building back better. The disruption to services requires us to build back better. Due to a reduction in services, fathers have had significantly reduced opportunities to participate in um, important parts of the pregnancy, including antenatal care and advice and information. Together, these can disrupt bonding, place strain on couple relationships, and increase the risk of developing mental health difficulties for both mothers and fathers. But fathers are visible. They are at home more. Some fathers are at home more. And we must seek new opportunities to directly engage with them alongside the mother and on their own if required. Fathers can be great advocates and on the ground supporters. Um, so the messages they receive, they can uh, repeat at home. Fathers can support the use of technology and learn new ways to support breastfeeding through that. And fathers who have missed the key early moments due to exclusion can benefit from support around building strong connections with their child, such as solo care. Mothers whose partners do more childcare are more satisfied. Going forward, opportunities to access flexible working, um, or certainly thinking about policies that can support flexible working, could support the changes within family behaviour we have seen this year. Online and telephone support is likely to remain as a core support mechanism for some time, but only for some families in some situations. Although some mothers felt supported by online delivery, others struggled finding online support impersonal, inaccurate or difficult to access. And many reported that their partner was not included in the call despite being in the room. Use of camera phones or Zoom for consultations can be used to improve fathers' knowledge of breastfeeding, particularly how to deal with difficulties. And a father holding the camera would imply he's listening, can remind the mother what was said and support her at three o'clock in the morning 
when other services are not available. After studying services for three years, three quick, quick questions keep coming up for me. Do services know who the fathers are? Do they collect their information? Do they have their contact details? Uh, are these questions asked early on during the pregnancy? And what is the offer to them and for their family? How do fathers know that the service is for them? And what stands in the way of direct engagement? COVID-19 has seen a migration of some fathers back to the home. Many fathers have had to work more hours and some fathers have migrated back to the home. Their involvement has been valued highly by the mother and mothers rate maternal health services better if they see that the service has involved with the father. Fathers typically desire to be well informed and engaged with, and they have their own questions. What they tend to have is a lack of opportunities to ask these questions. COVID has given us opportunities to work differently. If fathers are more visible, then we have to recognise and see that they have their own unique experiences and requirements. Let's spend a bit of time thinking about what this might look and feel like in the different elements of the healthcare system. So here's a basic diagram. We're very used to triads in, the, in healthcare services. So here's a basic diagram of traditional working practice where the service would work with the mother and the child and the mother-child relationship. <coughs> this is something we would all recognise. Now let's look what happens when we throw the father into the mix. And we will put the service in the middle. Now the service is working with the child, the mother-child relationship, the father-child relationship and the father mother relationship and this requires active engagement with the mother and the father what might this feel like for the service or for the worker in my research workers tell me this can feel quite emotionally charged quite tangled sometimes scary but always powerful and what it does give us is a clear picture of what is going on within the family dynamics. Often working with fathers can be seen as ad hoc or vulnerable to funding cuts. And in my research, certainly led by specific um, champions. To embed inclusive practice, some assessments of services can be made. Does the service specifically invite mothers and fathers? Sometimes fathers will view maternity um, and perinatal services as for mothers and will need a blatant message saying, fathers, we mean you too. Does your handouts, publicity or promotional material or um, any information material address the father's role and how he can support uh, the mother's breastfeeding journey, but also the father-child relationship and his own tra uh, transition to parenthood. Are fathers actively engaged during interventions? This means actually getting down on the floor with the father, um, talking to him, pulling him into uh, 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 any interventions. Does your information mention that you view breastfeeding as family teamwork? Although individual support is important, breastfeeding must be considered a public health issue that requires investment at society level. Focusing solely on solving individual issues will not lead to the cultural changes needed to normalise breastfeeding. It's widely recognised that our behaviour as individuals is affected by all of these systems and structures um, of the environment and society we live in. 
Each of these influences should be seen as an opportunity to increase discourse and, for fa and fathers are in there. To conclude, the role of the father and what we believe they are and do sits within complex and often competing frameworks and discourse around gender equality, <coughs> public policy, masculinity and social and cultural norms. And as the role of the father in families has changed over time, and so has our understanding of his influence, public policy and the offer to families has failed to catch up or represent the realities and aspirations in family life. The restrictions during the pandemic has required us all to work and live differently. While many important services have been reduced, there are opportunities to work differently with the family around the mother and build upon new relationships with the father going forward. Thank you. Back to Amal. Thank you so much, Jess Emma. And I think that building back better, you have really expanded on what that means in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, we have many challenges. And I think like you say here that we have a complex, uh, many complex uh, concepts and uh, discourses that are also competing with father's involvement and also breastfeeding. So it's really important that we talk about these and that we get this right. Um, in, in the poll that we had, uh, we can see that, um, that many people think that um, healthcare practices that are not encouraging uh, are actually behind the, the fact, a great barrier to, to getting fathers engaged and involved. But we also have quite a few uh, reporting that negative attitudes and also the lack of support at the workplace and lack of parental or paternity leave. And some of the questions that are coming out in the Q&A, I think also relate to all of these uh, topics. So encourage you to post more questions and the panelists and speakers will answer them. So we are now going to move into the last presentation for uh, this webinar. And I would like to introduce uh, Riveti Ramachandran, who is the Senior Program Coordinator of WABAN. She has a degree in chemical engineering and a master's in food technology from the University Science Malaysia. Her work experiences are in the field of gender, maternity protection, breastfeeding, advocacy, community monitoring and sustainable agriculture. So Riveti, I'd like to um, give you the floor. Thank you, Amal. Good evening, everyone. Today, I will present on WABA campaigns and tools to ensure greater father and community involvement in care and breastfeeding. By now, we can all concur that breastfeeding is a team effort. It requires a warm chain of support that empowers mothers to breastfeed optimally. Part of that warm chain of support would be a gender equitable parental social protection that includes measures such as paid leave and workplace support, that can help create the enabling environment for breastfeeding in the context of both formal and informal work sectors. WABA's Warm Chain campaign places the mother-baby diet at the core. It strives to link different actors across the health, community and workplace sectors to provide a continuum of care during the first 1,000 days that is from the start of pregnancy to the child's second birthday. Paid leave for parents and workplace support is critical after the delivery period as shown in the slide here. The Empowering Parents campaign promotes social protection that will facilitate the integration of parents' productive and reproductive work in both formal and informal settings. We advocate for parental social protection that includes public funded paid leave policies and legislation and parent-friendly or family-friendly workplaces. Over the years, WABA has developed several campaign tools. I will be talking about three tools today. The first is the Parents at Work Advocacy Tool. This tool summarizes the nationally mandated leave that is maternity, paternity and parental, breastfeeding breaks and the provider of these benefits in 195 countries. The WABA Warm Chain Information Cards has information for targeted stakeholders 
such as fathers, lactation consultants, pediatricians, academicians, and many more. And lastly, do join our Father Support for Breastfeeding Facebook group. These tools have been used widely by advocates and community members globally in breastfeeding advocacy efforts. Please refer to our web, WABA website to access all these tools. Let's look at the snapshot of LEAF in Southeast Asia. From what we can conclude here, most countries in Southeast Asia do not have paid breastfeeding breaks. Fathers are usually given less than one week of paternity leave and there is no parental leave. And mothers usually get less than 13 weeks of maternity leave. You can refer to our WABA website for more comprehensive details. It is important for all of us to remember that we need to work on maternity, paternity and parental leave to achieve a healthy, just and gender equal society. Let me share with you some examples of successful implementations of our campaigns to date. An initiative that reflects the concept of warm chain is the Making Penang Breastfeeding Friendly or the MPBF. The MPBF is a multi-stakeholder model that has ensured that breastfeeding is now anchored as an important issue in the political agenda of Penang. The Breastfeeding Friendly Workplace Accreditation that is following the Australian Breastfeeding Association's accreditation model will ensure that space, time and support is in place for all employees to successfully combine breastfeeding and work in Penang. The Warm Chain Seed Grant projects have created awareness and linked many various stakeholders. For example, in Mauritius, we have seen more male and in-laws involvement. There has also been a slight increase in the rate of early initiation to breast and a good progress in exclusive breastfeeding has also been observed. The parent-friendly workplace seed grant projects have galvanized actions in Africa, Asia and Latin America. In India, sustainable partnership was developed to ensure exclusive breastfeeding for the children of working women engaged as construction laborers. There are four key messages that I have for all of you today. First, a warm chain of support for breastfeeding by linking community peer groups and healthcare providers will provide unbiased, consistent breastfeeding information and support throughout the 1,000 days. Improved national laws that cover maternity and parental social protection will definitely support optimal breastfeeding. Workplace support such as breastfeeding facilities, paid breastfeeding breaks and flexible working arrangements is critical to ensure that breastfeeding continues when parents resume work. Various tools for engaging parents such as the WABA resource website, parents at work chart, warm chain information cards and our father support Facebook group can be adapted and used globally in all breastfeeding programs. In conclusion, an enabling environment for breastfeeding requires an essential package of interventions such as maternity and parental protection, as recommended in the ILO C183 and R191, training of health professionals and community workers, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, access to breastfeeding counselling, as well as implementation and monitoring of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes and relevant World Health Assembly resolutions. We believe that with these interventions, that we will create positive impact for all parents to achieve their breastfeeding goals. Thank you very much. Over to you, Amal. Thank you, Riveti. And I think that, um, that the action part, the advocacy that we need to take, we have understood and we've listened to the evidence and what, why this is important to involve fathers in breastfeeding support. And I think this goes across the board in all parts of the world, every country and every area. We have also heard from three countries in, in Southeast Asia of how it actually works and how it has come about. We've heard from Indonesia, how a social movement has been formed. We've heard from Myanmar also how positioning as a child right issue is important and to involve both parents 
And we've also heard from the Malaysia and the personal perspective, the individual perspective, how important this is and how you have to stick to your agenda and you have to work together as a team. And your COVID pandemic has given the challenges, but also opportunities and how to create the services to get better uh, services that are inclusive as well. And we have the campaign tools at hand, and I think more will be coming out too in the near future. So just to, um, to conclude, we have a poll. We have one poll question here, um, and this is related to paternity and parental leave. And so the question goes, in your opinion, how long paternity parental leave should be allocated for new fathers or co-parents to share the care work and support breastfeeding? So if you'd like to answer that question. Uh, we have actually a few minutes left, so I will be picking out one question from the Q&A. And this is a question from Aung Chang, Aung Chai. Our projects are mainly focused at really hard to reach areas and high poverty villages. Fathers are really busy with their livelihoods and difficult to arrange meeting with them. Could you give me a suggestion for that? Could you please provide us operational guidelines on how to increase fathers in SBCC meeting? Thank you so much. So I would like to ask um, John uh, or Lynn or Duncan, one of you to, to respond and also um, from Indonesia, um, Rahmat. So if John or Lynn would like to respond to that and then we'll take a response also from Rahmat. Uh, that question I actually saw come up and it's a challenging one uh, because it, the, the principles that we've been talking about in terms of having uh, fathers and mothers work together uh, are still applicable, but the situation is very different from what many other people might find themselves in, uh, where now you've got you know, people who, fathers who need to work long hours. And so the, the teamwork, the coordination needs to change. Uh, it needs to adapt to this situation where you, you don't have perhaps the same amount of time or flexibility. Uh, fathers can still be involved, fathers can still, uh, feel like they're a part of things. In some ways, it's, it's even more important as a mindset than it is necessarily as a, uh, as, as a practice that fathers feel like when I'm there, I'm connected to my, my wife and my child and I'm doing what I can to be a part of this team. Thanks. Uh, Rahmat, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, so what I actually do is before before the class, uh, we we have a pool for the participants and almost 95% of those uh, choose uh, the time uh, for the, the class uh, in the weekend uh, at 7 to 9 p.m. So uh, we already know what time and what, uh, what days that they are free and try and, and have the, 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 the class to be the participant. I think that's a lot. So the timing is important, yes. And I think it is difficult. It's not, it's, there are challenges along the way. Um, we have also comments coming up and showing that of course there are some, uh, some um, uh, experiences from Brazil and from Latin America and elsewhere where there has been a rejection and, uh, and uh, also encouraging. So I think that the time is right that we do discuss this. We will be having um, a second seminar uh, in this series uh, in January, February, looking at the, um, the Africa region. And to, it, it will be interesting to see um, if there are differences and what similarities there are. We do, WABA has developed a warm chain postcard for fathers specifically, and this is a collaboration with the family included and, and others also. So please do visit our website. Um, we will post the links also. So follow us on the social media. Um, I'd like to thank the participants, uh, all of you attending, the panelists, of course, for presenting wonderful uh, and sharing their experiences. And um, 
wishing you all a, a safe um, time ahead as we go through the, the tail end, hopefully, of this global pandemic. Um, stay safe and happy holidays. And thank you so much for participating uh, wherever you are. It's been a pleasure. So with that, I think we will um, end this webinar. And uh, thank you very much. The recording of the webinar and the slides will be posted on the WABA website and also on our social media. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>